the band doing all right today? Is everybody yep. praising the Lord? Yes, Praise the Lord for the band right quick. Amen. They get here up and early and get here to worship and prepare for worship. And, you know, can't say enough thank you guys and how much I appreciate you. Uh, hallelujah. It's good to see you today. Uh, we're returning from the, the uh, little country of Belize here this last week. Had a great, great pastor's conference. You know, I, I wish there's some way just to bottle up the results of that so that I could share with you what those were when we come back. It just doesn't seem that words really express, you know, what, what happens in those kind of events. Uh, we meet with those pastors in Belize. Uh, we had those pastors and their wives there for a very special time in the Lord. And uh, it was it probably, of, of the, we've done those for 12 years now. We've gone down to Belize and done these pastor's conferences and you've, finance those conferences for them. And, you know, for 12 years, we've seen God do a great, great deepening work and a maturing process. And so many of these guys have never had any kind of training whatsoever in ministry. And, you know, uh, there's no Bible colleges that are there to speak of. And so, you know, they just, they're in there digging down and digging hard and getting in the word and growing and learning. And man, when they come to these conferences, they just come with cups ready to be filled. I mean, they, they come hungry and thirsty with pen and pencil in hand. And I would say out of all these that we've done in recent years, this is probably one of the highlights, one of the best we've seen. Uh, uh, just a very unique time of the Lord. Uh, some of you are familiar with those pastors down there. And just let me say a quick word for those of you who are. Some of you are familiar with Pastor Lloyd Welch. He had to resign his church a couple years ago because of health. He's one of the guys that dates back in Belize to when I went in the early, early days. Uh, back when uh, it was Terry Acker and Terry Dixon and I went down there to do a a revival in a, in, a, in a church down there and, and participate in the citywide crusade. Uh, we met Lloyd Welch back in those days, and he was, he was a character then. He, he was a guy who ran around in a taxi cab and had speakers on top of his cars and preached the gospel up and down. And when, you know, when people needed fares, he'd take the speakers off and, you know, put the taxi sign back up and, you know, and pass out gospel tracts. And he was always, you know, it still is this day, he's just a soul winner. Uh, when, he, when he travels and when he traveled abroad, he would come here. He's preached here once before, I believe, in our, own, in our, in our church. And when he came up that time to be with us that time, I said, well, did you fly? He said, no, I took the bus all the way from Belize to Mexico up to, you know, uh, all the way to Houston. And I said, why in the world did you take the bus? He said, oh, man. He said, those long roads, you get to witness to so many people. <laughs> You get to pray with so many people. You're there a long time. They're not getting off, you know. <laughs> they can't go anywhere. But um, he got to come the last two days of the conference, and what a blessing it was to see him. And he said to you guys, he appreciate your prayers. He's been very sick, and he's doing a lot better now, but uh, appreciate your prayers. And said, tell all my U.S. friends hello in spring there. So I wanted to, to convey those messages. But, you know, I just wish there was a way to put that all in the castle. Maybe I'll show a few pictures next week and just from the conference itself when we start the message. But... To let you know, uh, your investment has gone in incredibly, uh, it's, it's, it's incredibly paid off in so many different ways in so many different lives. And I'll, maybe I'll, I'll, when I do this slides, uh, we give them an evaluation for them. I'll share you some of that, that as well, what the Lord did there. But let's get into our message series we've been in. Thank you, Brother Tim, for preaching for me. And, you know, I, Tim appreciates when I don't give him my sermon outlines to preach because they don't make a lot of sense just looking at them. So <laughs> gives the opportunity to share what's on his heart. And I appreciate you, brother, and your faithfulness to the pulpit when I'm gone. Amen. As we get into this series on No Turning Back, this is part four. And this is that series where we talk about how to never stumble. How, how, you know, that you don't, you're not ashamed when you stand before the Lord Jesus one day and you hear from him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Now, I believe that's every one of us who know the Lord on any kind of level. I think that's in all of our hearts. I, I believe the Holy Spirit places that in our hearts. That we, we stand before the Lord one day and, and he says to us, you ran well. Well done, good and faithful servant. We, that's just not going to happen by hoping it so. And the scriptures lay out so much for us so that we can understand who we are and what God's given to us. I think most people fail in their Christian walk in life because they really don't know what God's done for them already. And that's the heartbeat of this whole passage where, where we get into 2 Peter. 2 Peter, for the most part, deals with apostasy, fake believers, fake preachers, fake teachers, you know, false churches. But he deals with the first verse in this first chapters here of just the, the real deal, all right? Before he starts approaching, you know, you know the, the, that which isn't real, he deals with that, those people who are true and tells them, hey, 
you, you need to hold on and here's how you do that. And so let, let's get into these verses. We've read them each week and we'll continue to as we go over this. Is that grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything. I underline that. He's granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who's called us by his own glory and excellence. In other words, if you've trusted Christ, you have everything you need. All right, he's, he's, he's called you by his glory. He's called you by his excellence. You've come, to, you've come to the source of real living, all right? And not only have you come and he's called you and you've taken part now in this life, he's given you, through your relationship to him, he's given you everything that pertains to life and godliness. And then he says, for by these he's granted to us his precious and magnificent promises so that by them you may become partakers of the divine nature. What, what's he talking about here? You, you, you know, you get to know the Lord Jesus Christ. All right. But he's granted to you everything you need. Where, where do I find it? I find it in the word of God. Verse five, for this very reason. Now, so verse four, he says, for by this, he's granted us these precious promises. Then he gets into verse five. He says, so for this reason, since you have all these promises, apply all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence or virtue. It may say in your Bible, supply virtue and in your virtue, knowledge, and then he goes on to say, and in your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities, he's listed seven things there, if they are yours and they are increasing, then they will render you, this will do something within you. You won't be useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, but if you lack these qualities, then you're blind, short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Therefore, brethren and sistern, be all the more diligent to make certain about your calling, his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you never stumble. For in this way, the entrance to the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, will be abundantly supplied to you. Now, as you look at these verses we shared last, last couple weeks, that the motivation behind all this is that he says, in doing these things and making this application, these seven qualities into your, to your faith life and your faith walk and your relationship with Jesus, he said, in doing that, then these things will render you. you know, they'll, they'll do a work in you. Something will happen inside you as a result of your commitment. God does something for you. And when do you want? You won't be idle. You know, you won't, you won't be unfruitful and you won't stumble. Now that's the, the, the character traits of people who are not pursuing these things. In fact, he says later on, he said, they're short-sighted. In fact, he said, you can get so bad in your walk with Jesus. If you are a Christian, you just get to places you don't care. He said, you, you, you become blind, you become short-sighted. You forgot about your sins that God has purged you from. That's a bad place to be. So he gives us this motivation to say, there's something, there's a higher life and there's a way, there's a way and there's a pathway to get to that higher life, but you have, you have some choices that you have to make. And now the method is for, for this is, he says, this is the way you keep from being unfruitful. This is the way you keep from falling. You apply diligently. Remember we talked about, I mean, you've got, you, there's a commitment that you have to make. You apply in your faith. You have this new life with Jesus now. So now that you're saved and know you, you have saving faith in Christ, you know, you've been called of God. You, you belong to Jesus. You're in the kingdom of God, the family of God. Now that that's happened, here's what you need to do with your faith. You make, be diligent to supply moral excellence. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago, which has to do with virtue. You've got to have a moral standard in your life. You've got to have purity in your life. And all through the scriptures, it, it seems that the first element that after coming to know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, it seems that the first element in all the Bible seems to be, once you come to Christ, get this area of your life right. You know, get a moral compass in your life. Get a moral stand in your life. You know, this is one of the problems we're facing in election year in America. That, that one thing that America lacks across the board is having a moral compass anymore. There, you know, there, there, there's, there's no standard of purity. There's no standard of morality anymore. Just it's whatever you want to do, you know, and whatever feels good for you. You know, in fact, not, not only do we, we accept that, we accommodate that. We'll give you your own bathroom for whatever you are, you know. We, and, and, and we'll make sure that if anybody says anything negative about you, we'll, we'll ruin their career. You know, we'll wreck their life <laughs> if they dare, if anything dare, you know, is, is contrary to, to what, because there's no standard anymore, except what the world says. And the world really, it has no standard whatsoever. 
So here we go where he talks about, here's, here's, a, here's a method, here's the way to, to increase, here's the way to be fruitful. You have to make some commitments and you have to be diligent in those commitments and the diligence is to add to your faith what? Virtue. So first step, what after that? We talked about week four last, knowledge. What knowledge of what? These precious promises that God's given us, knowledge of what the word of God has to say. And remember we, Hosea's comment we made from the Old Testament two weeks ago, he said, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge. And this is what I said at the beginning of the message. There's a lot of Christians who just fail because they don't know. They don't have a biblical knowledge of who they really are and what God has really done for them. There's just a, a failure to comprehend. When I mean, there's a failure to comprehend who you are, then you're up for all kinds of defeat. You're up for all kinds of failure. You're up for all kinds of attack. So add to your faith, virtue, add to your virtue, knowledge. And we talked about the importance of, you know, the importance of knowledge. And we also talked about how knowledge is, is, is it's biblical knowledge, not worldly knowledge. You got to have biblical knowledge and that's based upon the word of God. And how now knowledge is not, we don't stop with knowledge. If that's where we stop, we just end up arrogance. So we add to what we've got down here is information. We let it begin to transform us. And how do we do that? In other words, now we take this, this element of virtue and knowledge and we add to that. And I love this word. It's two, but it's one, self-control. All right, self-control. There's your response. It follows the knowledge. It suggests, it suggests that, I've got this information now. I need to respond to it. I need to do the right thing with it. I need to put what I'm learning here in my head into practice in my life. I need to not just know it in my head. I need to practice it in my relationships and practice it in the walk and the, in the affairs of my life. All right. It, it requires it. If I'm learning now, I need to move forward with just the learning. No, don't stop there. You, you put into practice what you've learned. In fact, the, the word here in, in the Greek language is, is a neat word, egretia, and it literally means to hold oneself in. I, I get to thinking of, 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 of middle-aged guys when I talk like that, you know, holding yourself in. <laughs> you got to exercise a little self-control and pull your chest back up where it used to be, you know. <laughs> But that there is an element of that mindset, and, but it goes internally, all right? To, to a self-control, to an attitude of, 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 I've had this information, God spoke to my heart, now I need to do something about it. He says, you make every effort, is what the scripture says, with all diligence, you make this effort to practice self-control. Now the Bible talks about, in four different kind of situations or occurrences, how, how self-control is achieved and how it's carried out and how it's worked in our life. But hey, out of these four occurrences, you know, this virtue, uh, this element of self-control has to do with, a, with, a, with a, you being in control of your appetites and your desires and even your passions. Ultimate means to have your emotions and your desires and your passions under control. Now, that's easy to say, but we don't see a lot of that practice in a lot of people's lives. We let so many things control us. We think we're in control, but one little thing gets out of sync and we lose control. The Bible says as believers now, God tells us how to respond and how to react in the world around us. He gives us knowledge. Now we need to make an application to what that knowledge is. Literally have your passions under control. One of these passions that gets so easily out of control is one we've talked a lot about on Wednesday nights when we've been dealing with the book of Proverbs. And here's what it says in Proverbs. He that is slow to anger is better than the mighty and he that rules the spirit than he that takes a city. In other words, you may think the guy who can con 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 conquer the city is something unique and special. No, he's nothing compared to the guy who conquers his own angers. Now, anger is an emotion. It's a legitimate emotion. We, you know, does anybody ever get angry but me? <laughs> no, we all experience anger on so many different levels. But the issue, the Bible says, be angry and sin not. This is that element of self-control. That I'm angry, but I'm, I'm not losing my grip, all right? I'm not losing my cool. I'm not losing my attitude. I'm not losing myself in this whole, this whole issue. Another verse in Proverbs later on down in the same context, he hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city that's broken down and without walls. In other words, a city without walls is e easily conquered, easily defeated. 
But a person who has control over his anger and over his emotions is not easily defeated. They're not easily conquered. I mean, think for a moment. Could it be that you've been kind of a pushover for the devil? Because you can't even control your own appetites, your own desires, your own passions, your own emotions. God says, here, now that you're saved, add to that moral purity and integrity there. And now add to that knowledge. Start growing in knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, with this, what you're getting informational-wise, let it be transformational. How's that happen? By self-control. You take authority. It's used in that sense of, of passions under control. It's also used in another sense. We said about four areas. This is the second of those areas. That it dealt with athletes and how through, through self-discipline and, and restraint and through diligence of bringing their body into submission that they were able to compete. All right. Now, as I was looking at some of these things, and we'll share the scripture just from up 1 Corinthians, but one of the commentaries put it like this. He says that these athletes would abstain from rich foods and wine and even sexual activity in order to focus all their strengths and all their attention on the training regiment. Paul talked about this a lot in, in both letters where he compared Christians to athletes and said, yeah, you know, you should exercise yourself in your faith. In 1 Corinthians uh, 9, 24, it says, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. They then do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable wreath. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way not as beating the air. But I discipline my body and make it my slave so that after I have preached to others, I may also not, will not be disqualified. And he's, he's liking it to those Grecian Olympic games that were so prominent in the world as they even are today with the, the Olympic games. Where athletes who wanted to compete, they had stringent rules and regiments that they imposed upon themselves so that they would be in peak you know, position of performance to be able to compete on any level. Paul said that's what we do in our spiritual life. We're, we're willing to literally, he used this term like beating our bodies into submission. Does that mean I sit in front of the mirror and beat myself up? No. He says, I have a motive and I have a, an aim and my aim is to run this race well. My aim is to stand at the beam of seat of God as he talks about later on and receive a prize. My aim is to glorify God in my life. So I do what I do with a purpose and my purpose is to win this thing. We as Christians need to have that same attitude, he says, as these Olympic athletes have, that they want to receive a prize, and so they're doing everything necessary to train and prepare themselves. Listen, nobody, nobody becomes a master in their athletic performance without diligence and without discipline and without, without sacrifice. Nobody becomes a great musician without practice and practice and practice. No, nobody becomes a, a, a great speaker without practice and study and effort. I mean, there's a diligence required. And he's using those examples from a physical realm to say there's a parallel to that in the spiritual realm that you can be excellent in your faith. You, you, can, you can be great for, in the kingdom of God, for the glory of God. There's something can happen in your life. So there's this one instance in this element. It's, 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 so we, we move forward. Another instance that we're in, in regard to this is when Paul wrote to Timothy and he said, listen, don't have anything to do with all these worldly fables, just fit for old women. On the other hand, discipline yourself for the purpose of godliness. For bodily discipline is only of a little profit. But godliness is profitable for all things since it holds the promise for the present life and also for the life that's to come. He said, listen, there's something to be gained even in this present life by you exercising yourself in righteousness. He said bodily exercise, it profits, but it's little, it's perishing. It's not going to last forever. It's nice to be in shape. We should take care of ourselves and we should exercise. Some Christians like to use this as, a, as, a, as an out for not doing anything and not taking care of themselves. That's not what he's saying here. He's just making a comparison between a physical exercise and a spiritual exercise that it's important that we stay in shape spiritually. How do we do that? By diligence, by developing disciplines in our life. If a, if the, if a, if a runner's gonna run, guess what he has to do to be successful at running? He has to run, all right? You gotta run. 
If a Christian's going to be successful, hey, he needs to pray. He needs to be in the Word. He needs to study the Scriptures. He needs to memorize the Word of God. He needs to be in fellowship with other believers. He needs to be sharing his faith. Those are just exercises of our faith. He needs to spend time with God. We be diligent to add to your faith, your life in Jesus Christ, these parts. The third thing in, in occurrence where he's talking about this, this concept of, 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 of self-control is when he's talking about where we really receive this in, in context of Galatians 5 when he talks about the fruit of the Spirit. And this is the key to this whole thing about, by the way, of having self-control. In, in Galatians 5, says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, Self-control. Against these, there's, there's no such law. What's he saying here? The key to discovering how to have control over your appetites is since you're a slave to sin before you know Jesus, when you come to Jesus, you're no longer a slave to sin. You're no longer bound by sin. So the key to your victory is discovering who you are in Christ. You have the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. And when the Spirit of God is truly filling your life, which has to do with controlling ruling over your life. When the Holy Spirit is truly ruling, then you can be ruling. But if I don't have the spirit control over my life, I'm not gonna have any self-control in my life. What God does for me when I submit to his spirit, he says, he gives you self-control. He gives you self-discipline. That comes from not something just of myself, although I have to make this first important effort it, and, and this commitment to faith, it comes to this place of saying, hey, I'm going to believe God to give me what I need for this situation. What do I need? I need self-control. In a, in a real sense, the term, it means more than just being you controlling self. It really gets down to the issue of, is the Holy Spirit controlling you so that you can be in control? Does that make sense? Is the Holy Spirit controlling you, thereby you're in control? But I tell you what, if the Holy Spirit's not controlling me, I have no control. All right? I'm, if I'm operating in the flesh and the works of the flesh are obvious, there's no control. All right. Just selfishness, self-seeking, you know, and we know if you read also in Galatians, it talks about what the works of the flesh are. But when I surrender the Holy Spirit, I'm not walking after the flesh. I'm walking after the spirit. Guess what happens? I have control. Now, as I said a while ago, the bulk of this letter deals with, with false theology and false prophets and doctrines and bad doctrines. And Paul was saying, hey, if there's bad doctrine, it's going to lead to bad behavior. If you don't know what to believe, if you believe anything comes along, then guess what? Out of that, your behavior's bad. Why does the world act so crazy? Why does the world behave so wrong? Why are their standards so far off base? Because they're living by bad belief system. It's that wisdom of the world versus the wisdom of God. And when you choose the wisdom of the world, if that's your belief system, guess what? You're, if it's bad, then your behavior's bad. When Paul wrote Timothy, he's telling him this. He said, to have nothing to do, again, with those fables that we said earlier. But now he says, now I want to know if anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus, and with the doctrine that conforms to godliness. If they don't believe that, then they're just conceited. They don't understand. They have a morbid interest in controversial questions. They dispute about words. Out of that arise envy and strife and abusive language and evil suspicions. Constant friction between men of depraved mind and deprived of the truth who suppose that godliness is a means of gain. So these people get so convoluted in their false theology that they think godliness is getting rich. That sounds like a popular theology today, doesn't it? Yeah. It's all, what's he saying? He said, you can tell if your doctrine is right or wrong. One of the key factors, it's all about you and what you get out of the deal. It's not about the, the God of glory. It's not about Jesus Christ. It's not about living for his glory. It's what I get out of this. Well, that's pretty much the church today. And unfortunately, this is, this is widespread in the Christian church today. I mean, with an idea, you know, that it's, it's all about what you can get out of the deal. There's a very popular pastor, and I'm almost afraid to mention his name because we've used some of his study materials, who recently got it and made the statement, you parents that just want to go to small churches and don't want to attend a mega church, you're just stinking selfish parents. Your kids need to be in a big group of kids. And so, you know, you're just being selfish as a parent if you, if you attend one of those kind of churches. Thing, man, you're selling a lot of material, buddy, to all those small churches. You might want to reconsider what you're saying there. You're making a lot of money off selling study guides and stuff to small churches. 
But that's the mindset. Just where, 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 Where's that in the Bible? Where's that in the Bible? And when did we ever find out that church was about getting a part of a big kid group so we can have more fun? When did the church come about having fun and having more activities and getting our own skating rink on premise and our own bowling alley and our own basketball court and our own, you know, what is, where'd that come from? Bad theology. And we just missed the mark all the way around. What's Paul wrote, um, Jude writes the church, pretty much a similar letter to 2 Peter. He says, hey, they're, they're, the people, they're just grumblers, finding fault, following at their own lust. They speak arrogantly. They flatter people only for the sake of gaining advantage. But you, beloved, you ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ, that they were saying to you, what were they saying? In the last times, there'll be mockers following their own ungodly lust. These are the ones who cause division, worldly minded, devoid of the spirit. People have no self-control. In other words, what happens? I tell you what, even recent studies, I mean, you don't have to go far to, to, to look and see that it's usually in smaller churches. I mean, those that don't run 10,000, usually in smaller churches where you have the greater number of people percentage wise far exceeds those people that are involved in church, involved in ministry, involved in serving the Lord. The percentage of people in smaller churches extremely far exceeds the people involved in ministry in the larger churches on a percentage basis. Where you might have 10 or 20% in a mega church, you get 80, 90% in a smaller church involved in ministry, involved in others, involved in other people's lives and helping other people and reaching out to other people. But again, when, we're, when it's all about us, we miss the mark. And this is poured into, as I say, to many of our contemporary churches today, missing it, what it's really all about. It's not about, it's not about ourselves and what we get out of the deal. It's about our relationship with Christ and our relationship to our Father and serving Him and loving Him and teaching our families to serve Him and to love Him and to be godly and honorable people. So we add to our faith not just information, it leads to a transformation. We add to our faith self-control. Let me just tag on one more word that he uses here. You know, uh, a person who exercises self-control will not easily give in to those, those issues of temptation and trials that normally cause a lot of people to just to, to quit, all right? When a, when a person's exercising self-control and something comes up in their life, they know how to, to rule there under the, under the headship of Jesus. They, they know how to take charge under the headship of Jesus, and so they don't bail out, all right? They, they, they tend to, to stay the course they know how to deal with issues of discouragement. They don't easily succumb to problems with relationships that go bad. They, they stay the course. They, they work on making things right. But not in the culture we live today. We just, we don't stay the course. Which leads us, to, you know, to, in the context of what he's talking about. The secret of perseverance. The secret of going on. It, 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 you begin to realize that God's God. He's given me everything I need to change life and godliness. I can be what he wants me to because he's given me what I need to be, what he wants me to. And so I'm going to hang on to him. I'm not going to view my circumstances as being in control over me anymore. I'm not going to let my emotions be in control over me anymore. I'm going to let Jesus be in control. And yeah, I'm going to get angry, but I'm not going to blow it this time. You know, I'm going to, I'm going to feel frustrated, but I'm going to persevere. Because I'm exercising self-control. And in your self-control, in your knowledge, and in your self-control, add what's doing. We'll add this last word today, perseverance. Now, I've got a few points I want to make about it, but it's, it's the last word in this series of messages we'll do with, of the things we're going to add to our faith. We've added virtue, more purity. We've added knowledge, all right? With the knowledge now, we're exercising self-control in, in carrying out that knowledge, and in that, we exercise perseverance. And the word may say patience in, 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 your, in your Bible. It's the same word. It's the, it's the word hupomeno in the Greek language, all right? And it has to do with a... With a with, with enduring on and, and pressing on and moving forward. But not just moving forward. There's this expectation in your moving forward. There's this, there's this, it, it's, uh, there's this joy in moving forward. And it, it's the idea that you may be surrounded with every problem that the world can present you, everything the devil can throw at you. But even though that's coming on, you, you have the end in sight, all right? There, there's this patience. And it has to do with consistency in your life. There's a, a constant that you're on. You're not in and out and up and down and back and forth. You, you've started moving and you're staying true to the course that's ahead of you. You've taken aim. You're focused. That's the idea of, of patience here. 
I think a lot of times we misunderstand what patience really means. If you look at it from just as, as a word and the entomology of the word, it's the word hupomeno, made up of two words. The first word, meno, literally means to, is to stay in a given place or to abide. Continue on a course is the idea. To endure. To, 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 to be steadfast. All right. But the word hupo, which is the first part of of that word, it says hupomeno, it has to do with being under something. All right, what are we under? In this context, obviously we're under Jesus, but in the physical world, we're under attack. We're under temptation. We're under pressure. So he's saying, once I've added to knowledge self-control, don't think that when you begin to exercise self-control that this sinful world is all of a sudden going to just become heaven. I think a lot of people have this expectation. All right, I did what I was supposed to do. But why is all this still going on? I did what I was supposed to do. Why am I having to deal with this again? Now listen, as long as you're in this fleshly body, you're going to have to deal with stuff. All right? This stuff that I've had to deal with all my life. Some of it not so often. Some of it just pops its ugly head up every once in a while. I mean, you ever looked in the rearview mirror and saw all the old enemies pursuing, it seems like, you know? I feel like Moses and they're out of, they've just left Egypt, you know, they're down at the Red Sea and everybody's having a party. And all of a sudden they, they look in their rearview mirror and here's the dust that's kicking up in the, in the horizon of the Egyptian army following them. Oh man, I thought we got out of there. They didn't go away. We're in this physical body still. We still have these passions and these desires and appetites, but they all need to be submitted to the, to the grace and the, and, the, and the glory of God. And God will give us what we need that pertains to life and godliness. So I, I absorb the promises and I begin to add to my faith what these promises declare. And guess what? Happened? Now these things, hey, they may catch up, but if they do, they're doomed. They're going to drown. All right. I don't have to be swayed by them anymore. I don't have to be moved by those things anymore. I'm going to be moved by the spirit now. And this is the idea of what patience is. People say, oh, Lord, give me patience. Or they're praying, oh, Lord, I don't want patience. But it refers to a quality that does not surrender to circumstances or succumb to things that may happen in our life. It just keeps on pressing on and keeps on believing God. It's associated, though, with a, with a cheerful, a joyous expectation. All right. What's the joyous expectation? I'm getting ready to get in a fight. But bless God, I'm going to win it. <laughs> you know, and I ain't going down without a fight. There's a, there's an expectation that, that we are more than conquerors. And now I'm getting ready to experience that. It's no good just to have a memory verse in my head. I want to live it, but I'm not going to live it without the trial. I'm not going to live it without the, being tempted again about it. All right. There's stuff I get tempted. Like I say, it may be from, a, I may not have been tempted in 30 years with me. All of that stuff, it sticks his head up. So, but that's all right. It'll go down again. And there's, a, there, there's this attitude of, of freedom and there's this attitude of joy that comes along. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, your patience of hope in the Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our, our Father. Now, this, this is not that grin and bear it mentality. I just, it comes again. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, you know? Oh, God. Count to ten. Ten never helped me. I count to hundred and still blow up. Amen. But grace helps, and God helps, and the Spirit of God helps, and He'll give you that through the Spirit of God. As He said, it's fruit of the Spirit. You can enjoy this kind of freedom. Said, okay, Pastor, I'm just about convinced. Where can I get this kind of patience? Well, I'm so glad you asked. Because ultimately, God Him source is the, is the source of this patience. Listen to what he says. The God of patience and consolation will grant you to be like-minded one towards another according to Jesus Christ. Colossians, you'll be strengthened with all might according to His glorious power unto all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness. What's he saying? This comes from the Lord. If you need this, it comes from the Lord. And here's the even better part of it. Not only has it come from the Lord, it has already come from the Lord. Well, what makes you say that? He already told you that. God's given you everything for life and godliness in verse 2 and 3, right? So I have what I need. So me, for me to sit around and say, well, oh, I just need patience. Well, that's kind of stupid. You already got it. Right? Lord, just give me patience. Now. No, you got it. You don't have to ask for it. Now, you may ask it differently. Lord, I thank you for the patience you've given me. 
I'm choosing to walk in it. I'm choosing to trust you. Remember, it goes back to Galatians 5, where it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. You know, it, 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 one of the elements there, he says, it's, it's patience. Not only is it, is, is it self-control, that I can, I can continue in that self-control. That's the patient part. All right? That's the moving forward. A lot of people think of long-suffering when it comes to patience. Well, patience, but patience isn't long-suffering, all right? Those are two different things, and the Bible says God will give you both. It's a fruit of the Holy Spirit in your life. When you surrender to the Holy Spirit in your life, you, you can have patience and long-suffering. Long-suffering is, it deals more with endurance towards people, all right? Amen. Some of you have been suffering a long time on some folks in your life, all right? Some of you are married to them. I'm, no, I'm sorry. <laughs> but God gives you that. God gives you what you need to make the relationship work. And he'll give it to them when they need it to make the relationship work. But he'll give it to you in every area of your life because it's what you already have. But now it needs to be diligently added to your faith. And how do you add faith? I recognize that it's mine in Christ Jesus and it's mine through the filling of the Holy Spirit. And so I don't have to pray for it and I don't have to ask for it. I just need to exercise it and believe what God says. It's like when the Bible says, you know, that the Satan throws his fiery darts at us, but God's given us the shield of faith. But you've got to raise your shield, right? And raising the shield, that's just that act of faith. I believe God. He's bigger than this temptation. I believe Jesus died on the cross so I don't have to succumb to this, this deal. I believe Jesus died on the cross so I can be the man of God. I, 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 I've been called to be. And I believe God's giving me what I need for that to be reality in my life. I say, Brother Joe, that's, that's what I'm looking for. It's in him. And it's in you because of what he's done. And in you because of the Holy Spirit, you surrender to his control and you'll see it. You say, well, just, uh, okay, okay, how, how, okay, it's there. How can I unpack it? <laughs> you know, how do I discover it? How to make it operate, exercise in my life? Well, I'm so glad you asked that as well because God has given you two theaters, two arenas in which that happens where, you, where you'll see it come to life and it's not just theology and it's not just knowledge, it's reality. All right. You say, well, what are those two arenas? You probably won't like either one of them. One is temptation. Temptation is always the opportunity to exercise what you have. All right. To, to, to step out and, and to use what God's been giving you. My brethren, count it all joy when you encounter various temptations. That counting it all joy is part of that, that, the attitude of faith. Temptations come. Last thing we do is want to throw a party. And it's counting it all joy. saying, hey, temptation's here. Celebrate. Why can I celebrate? Because you know this is only exercising your faith. And that, that's going to work out patience in your life. You, you, you're going to see patience come to life. And you're going to see consistency come to life. And so whatever you're under, that hoopo, you, you maintain that mano. You keep moving forward. And you do it with an expectation and excitement that Jesus is in your life and his spirit is in your life. And you have victory in this temptation. So don't, don't run and hide. It's a temptation. He said, have a party. Why? Because if you'll walk into that and meet it correctly... You'll see God do something big in your life. The other areas in trials and tribulations. And then these are the two areas where it's asking God to get us out of and God's trying to get you in them. Not only so, we glory in tribulations, the apostle said. Why? Because we know that tribulation will work out this consistency in our life. This cheerful expectation in our life. Excuse me, Pastor Joe, there's got to be two other avenues. No, this is the ones the Bible talks about. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't like either one of those. It's in your mindset is wrong. Your understanding has been manipulated by wicked forces and evil influences of, of, of a godless culture. It thinks everything just has to be cheesy and easy and instant and fun. Yeah, that's not where the real fun is. That's not where the real joy is. You've heard it said before, you know, if I never had a problem, I'd never know that God would solve them. From that song, from that Andre Crouch song. Hey, if I never have a battle, I'll never win a victory. I'll never experience the victory. And sometimes it comes in temptation and sometimes it comes in trials and situations. But the thing about it is God's given me what I need. And there are benefits. I think that's part of the cheerful expectation. There's something to be gained. You say, what's to be gained from it? Catch this, three things. And, and this is where I will close, all right? <laughs> what are the benefits of this exercise patience? One is, the Bible tells us, the results are, 
proven character. He even refers to the King James calls it experience. In Romans 5, it says, not only so, he said, hey, not only so, but we glory in tribulation, knowing that tribulation works patience, and patience works experience. Proven character. Now, it's one thing to say, I'm a man of character, but it's another thing to have proven character. Amen? It's one thing to have gold, but it's another thing to have purified gold. Gold of higher value. But it never happens without the fire. Not only do we have character that's being developed out of this, and integrity that's being developed out of this, but also the scripture says, you know, that maturity comes. All right? Knowing this, that the trying of your faith works patience, but let patience have a perfect work, that you may be mature or perfect, complete, wanting nothing. That's the benefit. That's what I'm looking forward to. Maturity in my life. More like Jesus in my life. More life for the glory of God being lived in my life. Making a difference in the world through my life because of what God's doing in my life. That's one of the reasons I have an expectation and a cheerful excitement about it. The third is this. It's just happiness in general. That state of blessedness. Behold, we count them blessed or happy which endured. You've heard of the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord that he's very full of pity and of tender mercies. That's just something, folks, about happiness that just beats the heck out of unhappiness. <laughs> you know? Pick one. Which one you want? I'd rather be happy. You know? The goal is not happiness. That's the world's goal. The goal is, is, is the glory of God. And the goal is, is, is our relationship with Christ and with each other. The goal is, is higher than the happiness. But the result of me being consistent and me being patient and me exercising self-control, it leads to joy. It leads to happiness. It leads to that state of, of, of blessedness that, you know, that, that the world can't ever give you. It's a higher quality of God's grace on your life. So let me put it as we talk close this word on patience. It's a glorious grace that God gives that has to be appropriated in Christ by our faith and then exercised daily in our trials, our testings, our temptations, and all our difficulties. Patience. So we've covered two of those seven qualities today. We've added to our, our knowledge self-control. What we're getting in here, we're living out here. Information's working a transformation. Got it? And not only that, it's not just self-control today. It's today and tomorrow and the day after. There's a consistency now. And you see as we've gone through this, and I think I said it in the very first sermon, as you build on these seven blocks, you realize that, that, that one leads to the next. And I like the way the New American Center says, and in your faith, more purity. And in your virtue, knowledge, and in your knowledge, you know, self-control, and in your self-control, patience. Each one attaches to the, to the next, like, like a train being pulled along. And the strength of that, of that is in the engine, and the engine is your commitment to Christ. The engine is Christ himself. The engine is these precious promises that he's given us so that we might participate in the whole process. So the glory of God the power of God and the grace of God and the promises of God are made available to us so we can be what God's called us to be. Let's stand with our heads back.